This is the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter, 2020. Sabbath afternoon, August 8. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, Your Word is so precious to us, particularly in these times when we may be isolated, we um, may be in lockdown, we may be suffering, we may be looking after someone who needs care. We pray, Lord, that you will be here to bless us through your Holy Spirit. We pray that your word will come alive and we will more clearly know how we can be of help to those about us in sharing with them the story of the lovely Jesus. Bless us each one, we pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Isaiah chapter 55, verse 11. So shall my word be. Be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Let's read that again, Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 11. So shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth, it shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it. When we witness, we speak of Jesus. But what would we know about Jesus without the Bible? In fact, how much would we know about the great controversy, the love of God, and the birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and return of our Lord, if we did not have the Scriptures? Although nature reveals the majesty and power of God, it doesn't reveal the plan of salvation. Jesus, through the person of the Holy Spirit, is, as it says in John 1, 9, true light, which gives light to every man coming into the world. Still, without the word of God to explain divine truth fully, the Holy Spirit's revelation to our hearts is limited. The written word of God is the clearest and fullest revelation of Jesus, the living word. Although the religious leaders studied the Word of God, many missed its primary message. Jesus said in John 5.39, You search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. Rightly understood, every teaching of the Bible reflects the beauty of Jesus' character. When we share the Word of God, Our primary goal is not to prove that we are right and that the other person is wrong. It is to reveal Jesus in every facet of the truth we share. Sunday, August 9. Symbols of God's Word. Question. Read Psalm 119, 105, Jeremiah 23, 29, Luke 8, 11, and Matthew 4, verse 4. What five symbols are used to describe the Word of God in these passages? Why do you think these five symbols were chosen to represent the Word of God? First of all, Psalm 119, verse 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And Jeremiah 23, 29. Is not my word like a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces? And Luke eight eleven. Now the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Matthew 4, verse 4, But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. The various symbols used in these passages describe some of the primary functions of the Word of God. When we share the Scriptures with others, it is like a light that illuminates life. Jesus, the light of the world, breaks through the darkness of their misunderstanding about who God is and the nature of his character. 
minds darkened with a misunderstanding of God are eliminated by the Holy Spirit through the Word of God. According to Jeremiah, the Word of God is like a fire and a hammer. It consumes the dross of sin in our lives and breaks our hard hearts. When we help people see in Scripture the glory of Jesus, their hard hearts are broken, and the fire of His love consumes the dross of selfishness, greed, lust, and self-centeredness. The Word of God also is likened to seed. The key characteristic of seed is that it is life-giving. Seed takes time to grow. Not all seeds germinate at the same time. Not all plants grow at the same rate. But under the right conditions, the life in the seed bursts forth through the soil into new life. When we plant the seed of the Word of God in the hearts and minds of others, we will not always see immediate results. But silently the seed is growing, and in God's own time, if they respond to the Holy Spirit's promptings, it will produce a harvest for God's kingdom. Jesus likens his word to nourishing bread. As many of us know, there are few things as satisfying as a good loaf of bread. The word of God satisfies the hunger of the soul and nourishes our inner spiritual longings. As you share the promises of the Word with others and help them discover that Jesus is the Word, their lives will be transformed by His goodness, charmed by His love, amazed at His grace, and satisfied in His presence. So, to finish today, again, think about the truths that we know only from the Bible. What should this tell us about how much we should treasure what it teaches us? Monday, August 10. The Creative Power of God's Word Question. Compare Hebrews 1, 1 to 3, Hebrews 4, 12, and Psalm 33, verses 6 and 9. What do these passages tell us about the power of the Word of God? Hebrews 1, beginning at verse 1. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And Hebrews 4, verse 12. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And Psalm 33, verses 6 to 9. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. And verse 9. For he spoke, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. The word of God is the living word. It carries with it the power to accomplish the things that it declares. Human words can speak of what is, but God speaks of things that are not yet done, and then creates them by the power of His Word. The Word of God is a creative word. The audible word that proceeds from His mouth has the power to create everything that it proclaims. In the creation story of Genesis 1, the expression, God said, is used repeatedly. In verse 3, then God said, let there be light. In verse 6, then God said, let there be a firmament. Then verse 9, then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together. Then verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb that yields seed, etc. And then verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven. And verse 20, then God said, let the waters abound. Then in verse 24, Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature. 
Then verse 26, Then God said, Let us make man in our image. And verse 29, And God said, I see I have given you every tree that yields seed which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed to you it shall be for food. God's declarative words had such power that when he spoke, dry land appeared, plants sprouted, flowers blossomed, fruit trees flourished, and animals sprang forth. There is a fascinating Hebrew word used in Genesis 1 for the creative activity of God. It is the word bara, B-A-R-A. In this particular form, it is used of God's activity to create something from nothing. The verb is used only when God is the subject. That is, God alone can bara, and he does so through the power of his spoken word. God not only created this world through the power of his word, but he also sustains and upholds it through his word. The same power that is in the spoken word of God is in the written word of God. The same Holy Spirit that was active in creation was active in inspiring scripture. He is present when we read the Bible or share it with others. There is life-giving, life-changing creative power in the word of God. As we read in the book Education, page 126, the creative energy that called the worlds into existence is in the Word of God. This Word imparts life. It begets life. Every command is a promise, accepted by the will, received into the soul. It brings with it the life of the Infinite One. It transforms the nature and recreates the soul in the image of God. End of quote. As we personally grasp the promises found in the Word of God, our lives are changed. And, as we help others to grasp these amazing promises, the Holy Spirit will change their lives too. So to finish today, imagine God spoke and it was. How can we grasp what this means? What does this amazing reality tell us about His power? Why should this truth about God's creative power be comforting to us? Tuesday, August 11. The Benefits of Studying God's Word There are multiple benefits to studying the Word of God. The Apostle Peter tells us that through the promises of Scripture we become partakers of the divine nature in 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4. James speaks of the implanted word which is able to save your souls in James 1 verse 21. Paul adds that the word of his grace is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Acts 20 verse 32. The Bible has a redemptive purpose. Seeing Jesus in all of Scripture, we are changed. By beholding him in his word, we become like him, as it says in 2 Corinthians 3.18. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. And from the Great Controversy, page 555, We read, It is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. End of quote. Question. Read 2 Timothy 3, 14 to 17 and John 17, verses 14 to 17. What additional benefits come from studying the Word of God? First of all, 2 Timothy chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation 
through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. And John 17, beginning at verse 14. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. Writing to his young companion Timothy, the Apostle Paul urges him to be faithful to Scripture and shares the benefits of studying the inspired word. According to Paul, the Bible is profitable for doctrine. It reveals truth and exposes error. It outlines God's plan for the human race. It reproves our sins, corrects our erroneous thinking, and instructs us in righteousness. The Scriptures reveal the righteousness of Christ. They lead us from the folly of our own sinfulness to the beauty of His righteousness. When we see Jesus' unselfish love in contrast to our self-centeredness, we stand amazed, as we behold in Scripture the depth of His compassion and caring. Our lives are changed. When we share His word with others, they too are radically transformed. Beholding Jesus in his word, we become more like him. Witnessing is not about sharing what we think or even what we believe. It is all about sharing the eternal truths found in the word of God. When the word of God has incredibly blessed our lives, we have the credibility to tell others how it can bless their lives too. And so to finish today, think about a time of difficulty that you personally faced and how the Word of God proved to be a strength to you. What did you learn from that experience? Wednesday, August 11. Applying God's Word. Someone has counted more than 3,000 promises in the Word of God. Each of these promises come from the heart of a loving God who, as it says in Ephesians 3.20, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. The promises of God are commitments that He makes to each one of us. As we claim these promises by faith and teach other people to claim them, the blessings of heaven flow into our lives. The Apostle Paul emphasizes this divine reality in Romans chapter 8, verse 32. He who did not spare his own Son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? The Apostle Peter clarifies this promise, declaring that his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. At Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. Through Christ's death on the cross and his victory over Satan and the principalities and powers of hell, he has provided everything necessary for us to live a godly spiritual life. He also promises to provide for our basic physical needs. Question. Compare 1 John 1 verses 7 to 9 and Philippians 4 verse 13 and verse 19. Although these promises are quite different, what do they teach us about the character of God? How have these promises impacted your life? First of all, 1 John chapter 1, beginning at verse 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Philippians chapter 4 verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And verse 19 of Philippians 4, And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. The promises that we have read in these passages each speak of something different. But the picture of God they give us is very familiar. They reveal a God of loving kindness, infinite power, and full of care for our basic needs. They give us the assurance that God cares deeply for us. Question, read Hebrews chapter 3, verse 19, Hebrews 4, 1 to 3, and Matthew 13, verse 58. What do these verses tell us about the need for faith? Firstly, Hebrews chapter 3 and verse 9. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. And Hebrews 4, beginning at verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they heard did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. For we who have believed do enter that rest as he has said. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. And Matthew 13 verse 58. Now he did not put many mighty works there because of their unbelief. There are so many wonderful promises of God in the Bible, and when by faith we claim the promises of the Word of God and believe them because Christ has promised, the blessings of those promises become ours. It is a lack of faith in God's ability to do what He has promised in His Word that limits the fulfilment of God's promises in our lives. Pray that God will lead you this week to someone who needs the hopeful promises found in the Word of God. Thursday, August 13. Sharing the Word Good news is for sharing. Think about the times in your life that you have been delighted with good news. It may have been the day you were engaged to be married, the birth of a child, a new job, or the purchase of a new car or home. You were so excited that you could not wait to share. It is wonderful to share our joy with others, But the best news in the entire universe is the story of Jesus. When we discover new insights in his word about the salvation that there is in Christ, our hearts overflow with joy, and we long to tell someone else. When the religious authorities tried to stop the preaching of the apostles, Peter declared in Acts chapter 4 verse 20, For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. And in Steps to Christ, page 78, we read, No sooner does one come to Christ than there is born in his heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. The saving and sanctifying truth cannot be shut up in his heart. If we are clothed with the righteousness of Christ and are filled with the joy of his indwelling spirit, we shall not be able to hold our peace. End of quote. In Romans 1, verses 14 to 16, Paul wrote, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek The Apostle Paul never tired of telling his conversion story. His heart overflowed with joy in Jesus. For him, good news was for sharing, and he could not be quiet. Question? 
What vital principles about sharing the word of God do Isaiah 50 verse 4, Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1 and 2 Timothy 4 verse 2 give us? First of all, Isaiah chapter 50 and verse 4. The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak, a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning, he awakens my ear to hear as the learned. And Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose, under heaven. And Second Timothy 4 verse 2, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long suffering and teaching. As we surrender our lives to Christ and His service, He will open doors of opportunity for us to speak a word in season, or at the right time to those whose hearts He has opened. In all of our witnessing, we must keep three biblical principles in mind. What we say, how we say it, and when we say it. So to finish today, who are some people with whom you are in contact And how can you be a better witness to them? Friday, August 14. God is working on hearts all around us. If we have the spiritual discernment to see what God is already working, we will regularly observe opportunities to share His Word with others. As God prepares the soil of the heart, we have the opportunity to sow the seed of the Gospel. The Holy Spirit prepared the hearts of Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the woman with the issue of blood, the thief on the cross, the Roman centurion, and many others to receive his word before Jesus ever met them. Through the circumstances of their lives and the impressions of the Holy Spirit, they were prepared to receive Christ's message. We may have a natural hesitancy to ask people if we can pray with them, share a Bible promise, or Give them a piece of literature. More often than not, when we feel impressed to share our faith with someone else, it is because the Holy Spirit who has impressed us has already impressed that person to receive our witness. And that brings us to our three discussion questions for this week. One, if someone should come to you feeling terribly guilty over something and needing forgiveness from God, what counsel would you give? And what Bible text would you share? What has been your own experience with guilt and the power of God's forgiveness in your own life? 2. Sometimes God brings people into our lives because He longs for them to know His truth. How can we be sensitive to God's leading? And 3. Dwell more on the power of God and the Word of God as revealed in the creation story and in creation itself. We can barely grasp the concept of the universe itself because it is so big and so vast. To think that the God who created it must be even greater than what he created. How can we draw comfort from knowing that the God we serve is so powerful? And not only is he powerful, but he also loves us. What great hope can we take from knowing these things about God? How can this knowledge help us to be better witnesses to others about him? Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled New Heart for Alex and it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Alex was diagnosed with congenital heart disease or a hole in the heart as a baby in Finland. Doctors hoped that the heart would heal itself, but it didn't. So when he was eight, doctors performed open heart surgery. Afterward, mother looked at the small boy lying in the recovery ward and thought, For some reason, God allowed this to happen. 
He has a purpose for our lives. Mother wrote about the experience on Facebook. Many Finns began to follow her Facebook page, allowing her to speak about God with people who otherwise would not listen. Alex was becoming a missionary. The boy recuperated quickly from the operation and returned home after only five days. It was a miracle. The devil had tried to snatch away Alex, but Jesus had given him a new heart. The summer, however, turned out to be hot. One evening, Alex complained about a pain in his chest. At the hospital, doctors saw that his heart had swelled to double its normal size. And it says to look at the photo below. And um, being a doctor myself, I'm looking at this chest x-ray photograph here. And it shows his heart is really well and truly more than double its normal size. Alex was rushed into emergency surgery. Hours later, doctors called the operation a success. The devil had tried to snatch Alex away, but Jesus had given him a new heart. Alex acted unusual when he returned home. Usually kind and quiet, he became aggressive and loud, especially toward father. One evening, Alex was particularly angry, yelling unkind words and tossing his eyeglasses on the floor. "'Why are you acting this way?' father asked, placing a hand on Alex's head to pray." This was something Father had done many times to pray. But this time Alex refused prayer. Take your hand away, he yelled. He turned to Father with a look of pure hatred in his eyes. Father had never seen such an expression on his face before. He went to the kitchen where Mother was preparing supper. This is not normal, he said. This is not our Alex. We need to pray. Father and mother walked over to Alex. Without saying a word, father placed a hand on Alex's head. Mother placed her hand on the boy's forehead. In the name of Jesus, we command you, evil spirit, to leave Alex, father said. We have given Alex to God, and you have no place in his life. After the prayer, Alex returned to his normal self. He smiled and laughed like nothing had happened. The devil had tried to snatch away Alex, but Jesus had given him a new heart. Mother hopes that Alex grows up to have a heart for mission and that his story will change hearts. I have given his life to God, Mother said. We feel that Alex has a special relationship with God. His life has been difficult, but we believe that God will do something wonderful with him. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind and Hearing Impaired, Christian Record Services for the Blind, the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel. You can also listen on the official Sabbath School 4 app and the Apple iTunes app, Sabbath School with Percy Harold. Remember, God is always faithful.